The subject of these videos is around pictures, in particular graphs. There are seven components of graphs that we're going to cover in this series of videos. The reason we're going to cover these seven components is because you may think that graphs are really easy to produce. You may think that when you're measuring something, you end up with something like this. The data comes out. It's read into a CSV file. And you simply take the data and transform it in some way into a nice graph. If only it were that easy. You've got choices to make. And the choices that you make determine how that information is perceived. It's not quite that easy. Let's look at some of those choices. Well, you've got options. There's a large variety of charts that you can use. And you've got to pick one and you've got to ignore all of the other ones. How are you going to make those choices? Well, this video series should tell you about some of the things that you need to think about whenever you're creating graphs. The title of this video is Gestalt, one of the factors to be thinking about whenever you create a graph. Now, Gestalt is a German word meaning shape, and it was studied extensively in the 1920s around visual perception. Kurt Kofka, a famous German psychologist, said, the whole is other than the sum of its parts. And this phrase has been translated to the very familiar saying, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What it's trying to get at is that you actually see something that's not there. Your brain overlays things in images. So you see more than what's actually there in the picture. Let's talk a little bit about Gestalt. There are several aspects within Gestalt. Similarity, continuation, closure, proximity, figure ground, symmetry and order. All of these things will contribute to the way that you create graphs and the way that you position multiple graphs within your engineering academic paper. Let's look at these things one at a time. In Gestalt, similar elements are visually grouped regardless of their proximity. They can be grouped by color, shape, or size. This example is around color. Similarity can be used to tie together elements that might not be right next to each other in a design. The law of continuity says the human eye will follow the smoothest path regardless of how the lines were actually drawn. The eye just rips straight across the page and follows that path down because they seem to follow each other. It's much smoother than bending at the middle. That's continuation. There's also closure. Let's look at an old Formula One logo. This is the idea that your brain will fill in the missing parts of a design or an image to create a whole. In its simplest form, it allows you to follow something like a dotted line to its end. You kind of imagine that things are closed. Large chunks of the outline can be missing and you can fill in the gap very easily. The brain has no problem filling in the missing sections to see the number there. Another aspect of Gestalt is proximity. There's a group of similar items on the left. There's three groups of similar items on the right. The white space does the work separating the two groups from each other and separating the similar items in the right group. Groups are very easy to see and your eye picks those groups out very quickly. But you also need to notice the interplay between foreground and background. Let me give you an example. This cute picture was used as a logo for a famous zoo in the US. Most people first see the tree and then the negative space leaps out at them and they see the animals. And then once they've seen the animals, it can be a little bit difficult to really appreciate the tree in isolation without the animals. They realize that different parts of the animals are parts of the tree, but it's still quite difficult to unsee the animals once you've seen them. So your brain tries to distinguish between foreground and background objects. When thing gets interesting is when the foreground and background actually contain two distinct images and art often takes advantage of this. Another aspect of Gestalt is symmetry and order. Your brain will interpret the picture on the left as a rectangle, a circle, and a triangle. Even when the outlines are incomplete, just because those shapes are simpler than the overall image. It's as if the art form cubism somehow exists at a very basic level in the brain. Another example of that is the Olympic rings. 
you see them as separate individual rings when actually it's a linked pattern like a chain. Let's look at Gestalt from a summary point of view. You see shapes when they aren't there based on foreground versus background. Similar objects are visually grouped. You instantly see the relationship between the squares, the circles in, in picture B. You then also do relative proximity, seeing two groups in D and three groups in C. Your brain automatically does this. You need to be aware of that when you're creating images and creating graphs because what you think you may be showing in your data may not be what people perceive. The title of this video is contrast. Contrast means things are different to each other. Have a look at this slide. I like this slide because it shows you that people see things differently. People who are, have some sort of color blindness will see different colors to those who don't. People with different problems in their eyes might only see black and white. And some people may be more sensitive to different variations in colors than others. Different people actually see differently. And what that means is a lot of the time you may think you see everything but you're only seeing with respect to what your vision can see. There are several principles to contrast to making things different and distinctive. First, when you're writing, there are many elements that you can vary. The typeface, the line, the thickness, colors, shape, size, space. You've got a lot of choices in the way that you're displaying your data or displaying your writing. If two things aren't the same, make them different, really different. Be bold. Use contrast to add structure and organization. There is good different and there's bad different. There's also different people. It's really interesting to go to an art gallery, go with a large group of people and listen to what they're talking about because lots of people see different things in art that you've never seen. If you go with a tour guide, they'll be able to point out aspects of art that you will never have heard about. There'll be all sorts of things that leap out at you that you would never have observed. You need to understand that different people actually see differently and perceive the world differently. And that makes the burden on the author to communicate very clearly. Let's look at some contrast. There's the newsletter on the left, fairly low contrast, and the newsletter on the right. The heading pops out at you immediately on the right. The section headings pop out, the text is fairly clear. It's very easy to get a sense of the flow of the diagram. It's very easy to get a sense of the flow of the article looking at the right. Whereas on the left, from a distance, you can hardly see the headings at all, aside from the first one. Here's another example of contrast. Where did your eye immediately go when this picture popped up? Now contrast can be good and it can be bad. There can be good different and bad different. Let's look, look at some examples. Now some people would find these colors quite offensive. They clash to some extent and they really make the picture pop out at you. But nevertheless, they tell a very clear story about the, the data itself. Let's look at another option. This is different data using the same map, obviously. Is it better? Well, you can clearly distinguish between the, the light and the dark areas and see the, the gradations. Is it better? Well, it's probably more consistent than the previous picture. Does it give you more information up to the message that you're trying to get across as to the color choices that you make? Things can get pretty complicated with color sometimes. For example, have a look at this one. This is a very densely packed three-dimensional picture. You've got the axis on the bottom, the years, the axis on the left, and then within the picture itself, you've got a scale going from low to high. Paints quite a strong picture of the changes that have taken place over the years. And you can see that some parts very quickly are darker all the way across. Some are dark in places and then drop out, but it allows you to really get a sense of the data quite quickly. I can live with that. It's livable for the story that I think this picture is trying to tell. The title of this video is repetition, another aspect of the title of this video is repetition, another aspect of images and graphs. When I had children, I gave them these two simple rules. Stop repeating yourself and start repeating yourself. Very confusing. Well, when they were little, the stop repeating yourself rule was excellent. It stopped them from asking them, from them asking exactly the same questions and it also meant that I didn't need to tell them twice to do something. However, as they got older, I needed them to repeat grammar, writing, schoolwork over and over again. So repeating yourself became a valuable thing. Rules have their place, but there are always exceptions and sometimes you just confuse your kids. In any event, 
Let's look at repetition. Obviously, something has to occur more than once. It unifies and adds interest. It may include a font, a thick rule, certain bullet. You tie elements together by repeating the elements. It communicates level in hierarchies, and it can be anything that the reader will recognize. But don't go overboard. It's easy to go overboard with repetition. So take it to a point, make sure it's telling a message, supporting your, your piece, but then stop it. Here's an example of repetition. The bow tie follows a nice pattern across the page, down the page, staggered all the way down. Ties it together and creates a unified whole. We've all got one of these, a curriculum vitae. It's got structure, bold typeface, larger heading at the top, smaller headings down below, the same font, the same spacing, the same indentation, the same alignment. There's a lot that's repeated in something that wants to really give a reader a clear view of the structure. Let's look at another example of repetition. Well, this one breaks the rules. There's squares repeated in a checkerboard pattern, but the painting is warped so that it makes you think from a certain perspective that the floor is actually bent. It's a clever piece. Here's another example. Now, you may or may not see that this is actually a picture of a cat. What you need to do is shake your head from side to side. And the faster you go, the more the cat will appear. Don't worry, if it doesn't work for you, shrink the image and you'll eventually see it. It's a great example of a repetitive element.